and welcome to Disputes and Perspective. I'm Doug Cherry, a partner in the Disputes team at Reed Smith. This podcast series will discuss disputes related trends, hot topics, and developments occurring in the global legal landscape, and hopefully provide you with some helpful insights and practical tips. If you have any questions about any of the episodes, please feel free to contact our speakers. Welcome back to our next episode of Disputes in Perspective. In this episode of Disputes in Perspective, we're looking at the employment and tax issues arising from employees working from home. Exactly what are the legal and tax issues associated with that and how can an employer make it work? I'm David Ashmore, a partner in the London Labour and Employment Office of international law firm Reed Smith. Joining me for our discussion today is Peter Farino, chartered accountant and a tax advisor here at Reed Smith with lots of relevant experience in helping employers in this area. Peter had a long career advising international clients on their cross-border tax, social security and immigration issues. He was also managing partner of one of the big four's global mobility practices across Europe and Asia, working in various countries across Europe for over 18 years as an international assignee. And what's more, Peter was also head of HR for an international business. So the perfect person to speak to today. Peter, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Let's start with what we're really talking about here. Please help us to understand what do we mean by remote working and why does it matter where people are working from? Why can't they just work anywhere they like? Thanks, David. I think you know, remote working is a term that started to be used more and more in the last couple of years just to differentiate it from working in an office. Companies have had home working policies or distance working or virtual working for a while, but all of those things have subtly different meanings and no company uses it in an exactly consistent way to another company. So I think we're just using the term today to talk about people that are working typically from home, but often in a different country to where they would normally be. And that's really what we're going to focus on today, the problems of being in a different country rather than just working from home. Thanks, Peter. What are you seeing in terms of trends in the market? Now companies are starting to talk about returning to work. They're starting to look at codifying what they'll be doing in the future. Some companies are saying, okay, everybody back at work. Some companies are saying people can stay at home. You see some companies talking about days per week or days per month and starting to see certain policies be um, rolled out or suggested. But I think the danger is it's too early to know the future. You see a lot of posts on uh, LinkedIn in the papers saying, oh, well, the future of work is going to be this or the future of work is going to be that. And in the future, this is going to happen. And I think it's too early to say it's going to vary by industry. It's going to vary by the role in the organization. It's going to vary by company culture. And no one size model will fit all. Answer will need to be developed that's specific to each individual organization, specific to the type of talent pool that they're using, typically looking at where the people they're recruiting from, whether they need to be in a big city, whether they can be somewhere else. And I think best practice is to say, okay, well, you're going to want to put something in place for a return to work for the rest of 2021. But really, anyone that thinks that that policy is going to be perfect for 22 or 23, probably best to just have an interim policy for now. And certainly that's the trend we're seeing from the work we're doing together, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. And just sticking with the basics and and focusing on tax, what are the issues an employer needs to be thinking about? Yeah, when someone works outside their um, home country in a different country, they're obviously the tax authorities in that country would be interested. A lot of what we do here is basically repurposing the type of structures that you would have historically used for a cross-border employee relocation or assignment, international expatriate assignment type work. But often if people are remote working, they may be in a country where you don't have a branch or a subsidiary or an affiliate. So while the questions are the same, the answers can end up being very, very different. Typically, people will be taxable in the country in which they are resident, but they're also able to be taxed in the country in which they are exercising their employment So if you have a London employer with an employee in France, France could potentially be wanting to tax that employee first, and then the UK would then tax them on the residency basis. And company structures aren't always set up to do that. 
You do have double taxation agreements, which then say what the order is of priority, who gets to tax first, and then who gets to tax later. But that doesn't always overlap neatly with the withholding rules, payroll. And so you need to look at that in a lot of detail. Most treaties will have a what they call a 183-day rule, which is to say that you won't have to pay tax in the country if you're there for less than 183 days, assuming that you don't have an employer base there and assuming that your employer doesn't have a permanent establishment there. But that 183 days can be calculated either in in the individual tax year by tax year or in a 12-month period ending or beginning in that tax year. So day 183 of 2021 is July the 2nd. So as we're just talking in May, June now, this is going to be very timely for people to make sure that if people are out in another country, they need to be back by the end of June, potentially to manage the risk of having to make filings for 2021. It strikes me that we still have a lot of people in the wrong place because of COVID. And we've been working on that together. And, w- and what I mean by that is we've got we've got new hires who can't travel to the UK to start work. We've got people who went home and it was only go- going to be a few weeks and they've not actually gone back and they've been working from home from abroad. So that sounds like a problem. What's been the approach of the tax authorities so far? In the early days of the pandemic, there were lots of tax authorities said that they were going to take a relatively relaxed view on the counting of days for the 183-day test. In as much as if you were stuck somewhere and you couldn't leave and you would have left otherwise, they didn't really want all the administration and the headache of picking up small pieces of uh, tax for individuals who maybe wouldn't be part of their system otherwise. So there's been a relatively relaxed approach for 2020. However, between lockdowns, when people did have the ability to return to their home country, maybe over the summer or early autumn before the second or third waves, depending which country you came in, I think the longer people have been there, the less likely they are to get some mitigation and understanding. The OECD published some helpful guidance in January of this year that said, look, you know, counting days isn't the only thing. You've got to look at why someone is there and if they would otherwise have left But the longer someone's been there, and certainly if people have given up rented accommodation in the country they were working and gone to a different country, you can't really say that you're stuck there, though. So it's very much facts and circumstances for each individual. But there's still the opportunity where people are genuinely unable to travel because of specific country risks to say, well, you know, we can still rely a little bit on that. So there's sounds like there's a bit of wiggle room, but there's this deadline coming in for tax filings. Um, Just give us a flavour, please. What have you seen employers doing in in light of these issues? Well, one project we did recently was quite informative. We sent a list, a spreadsheet to fill into the client, and it was, you know, name of the person, where they're employed, where they've been during the lockdown, what date they went there, and have they come back yet? And we looked there and said, okay, well, where do they have a filing obligation based on being there for those number of days and where haven't they achieved it yet we're able to identify that a lot of people that had gone and come back had never not been there long enough to create an issue there were people that hadn't yet created the issue but if they didn't come home soon they would and then once you start working through that you then see okay well there's a few people that have been there long enough to have a tax filing obligation even for last year then you move on to say okay well what is the tax return due date in that country And if they're going to be coming back to their home country, how do they claim double tax relief in their country of residence to make sure that they don't then have to pay twice? Most double tax treaties, you know, the clue is in the title, you shouldn't have to pay twice. It's about where you pay, but you still need to get that order of payment right and be paying in the country where the work is exercised and claiming the double tax relief in the country of residence. And then, of course, we get into the contractual piece about, you know, if you have created a liability in those countries, whose obligation is it and why? And I think really that's an employment law piece, which you've been looking at, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's really why we work so closely together on these things. Um, It's tax and employment at the same time. Whose problem is it? Well, of course, no one anticipated a global pandemic. UK employment law is all about the contract, really, and you go into the contract and, of course, it's all premised on the employee working in an office in the location where the employer is based. 
So employment contracts typically silent on it. Whose obligation is it? <laughs> For like the, the real world answer, I would say, is that it's the employee's problem as it's their decision to move abroad. That doesn't mean the company isn't also liable because of the way the tax laws work. I think the reality is it's a problem for both parties. The liability tends to to stick on both the employee and the employer. So it's not something the employer can just say, it's your problem, employee. The employer's got to be proactive. And I think the, the kind of common theme we've seen from the work we've been doing in this area is really it's to the mutual benefit of the employer and the employee to work together to get it right, to, to fix the problem from the employee's employer's perspective. It makes sense to help them out because you want to make sure the employee gets it right. It's not straightforward. And also because it can be a massive distraction for the employee. Sounds complicated about tax returns in foreign countries, but actually if you've got someone who knows what they're doing, it can be quite straightforward. It's it's just a filing. If we're talking about high earners who drive revenue and growth, it doesn't make any sense at all to be dumping that problem on that employee. Um, with the employee getting bogged down in the detail of foreign tax returns, you can help them fix the problem and, and get them to focus on something a lot more positive, like making money for the business. I think that's right. I think the approach we see the clients take is to, you know, firstly, you've got to fix the compliance, but there's also a lot longer term opportunity around if you give people the ability to work somewhere where they want to be and you support them coping with the compliance obligations in those different locations, you can get an employee engagement uptick from that and a potential benefit. And uh, yeah, that can also enable you to maybe hire people with skills in different markets that you wouldn't have to otherwise. I think what you really need is a process and make sure you understand which country everybody's in, what your process is per that country, where you need to run the payroll, where you can process things for the tax return. And the other thing not to forget is social security because people being in the country's social security system will determine not only the cost to the company, which can be varied massively between high cost and low cost countries, more than tax even, but also determines their benefits if they get sick, if they get, have need to go on maternity leave, if they pension you know, entitlements that accrue. So social security is um, another more complicated part of it as well and often gets overlooked. Yeah. And Talking of complicated things, uh, one point we should cover today is permanent establishment. Whenever I'm talking about a a non-UK employer having employees in the UK, and I'm talking to a tax person about that, they always mention permanent establishment or PE. Help us, Peter. What what is that about? PE is something tax advisors love to get massively excited about because it is where a company has an employee abroad who creates a fixed place of business through which the management or business of the enterprise is carried out. Now, every double tax treaty has a piece in it about what does and doesn't constitute a PE, and you need to go through a series of tests. But I tend to prefer looking at it from the other side. Let's look at the person first and what they're doing and then see if they are generating revenue and creating a PE or not, rather than say, well, what might they be doing and where might the risks be? Because yes, a permanent establishment could potentially create a very, very high tax cost, but in the last large number of cases, there won't be one if the person isn't revenue generating. I think it's a second theory consideration for now, and particularly that OECD guidance I mentioned earlier, helpfully said, if you didn't have a PE before, a bit of remote working during a pandemic won't create one. However, if you had one that you weren't really acknowledging, it isn't going to help you. So, And if the person was there before the pandemic and they're still there after the pandemic, you do really need to look at your PE situation to be utterly clear that you're not generating taxable income as far as that country's tax authority is concerned. But it is a, you know, it's a small percentage risk of a very large problem, potentially, in many of the cases. So it always needs looking at. And just dumbing it down a bit for... For me, <laughs> what are we really talk- talking about? Is it the are we talking about the risk that the profits of the employer get taxed somewhere else? Is that right? Yeah. So if you had a salesperson that happens to deal with customers in a specific country and he's gone and spent lockdown in that country and he talks to customers only based in that country, it would be quite difficult to argue that the profit that's generated on sales to those customers 
isn't in some way linked to the fact the sales representative is in that country. So that's probably the easiest situation to visualize and to see. Yeah. But if the person isn't generating revenue and isn't speaking to customers, that's the further away you get from the uh, revenue base, the more difficult it is to prove a PE. It's the classic follow the money. <laughs> yeah. And so just jumping back to employee tax, how does that work in practice? If I'm a, an employee and I was paying tax in the UK and now I've gone somewhere and I'm working somewhere else, am I, uh, am I going to pay tax twice? Ultimately, you shouldn't. What you will do is you will pay in the country where you're working first. They have the first right to tax it because that's where your employment is exercised. Then you will claim a double tax relief credit or exemption in your home country tax return. The problem may come is if someone is on UK payroll and subjected to PAYE, for example, and they are locked down in a country like Spain and then they're paying Spanish taxes on a non-resident basis month by month. They may be out of pocket for two sets of taxes at one moment in time, but they would later then be able to claim a refund of the PAYE for the Spanish taxes paid. Although as the Spanish rates do cut in a bit higher, then ultimately you you bear the higher tax rate of the two Uh, is your worst case scenario, but you shouldn't have to bear it twice. That does assume that people stay tax resident in the country they were in pre-pandemic. If someone has gone to live and work abroad and they've decided to stay there and you as an employer have decided to let them do that because you're not going to enforce office working post-pandemic, then you've got to look and say, well, have they broken tax residency or not? And if so, have they broken it even back to the day they first went abroad, you know, this time last year or earlier? And to a certain extent, you don't know whether someone is still tax resident in their original country until you know if they've come back or not. Because if they end up staying abroad, they stopped being resident in the first country a long time ago. If they end up going back and they weren't away long enough to break tax residency, they never lost it. So it's uh, you're in this element of uncertainty at the moment until you know if the person goes back or not. And then you've got to manage the compliance effectively there and just understand which country you're filing in and what basis you're filing resident or non-resident. I think for a lot of companies, you know, you need if you've got a lot of employees to project manage it as a, at the employee level rather than or at the employee base level rather than doing it case by case, person by person. Because if you know you've got 10 people in different places, gather that information in one go and instruct the tax provider rather than trying to deal with it ad hoc. One of the employment issues that comes up here is, a, is around uh, managing the risk, managing compliance effectively. What is it that you can do as an employer to, if you want to go down this route, to to make it as painless as you possibly can, recognizing that it is a very difficult, complex area of law, both in terms of employment law and also on the tax side as well. And just to give you an outline of the kind of issues that we're seeing, I mean, some of them are really straightforward, but very practical. So you've got somebody who's working, perhaps they're working outside the EU. Are you worried about data protection? Can you even send the data to them to do their job? Practical things around travel costs, you know, who's going to pay for what? What happens if you need the employee to come back to the UK unexpectedly? That's going to cost a lot of money. Who's going to pay pay for that? Um, more structural issue around pay in general. You know, a lot of clients at the moment having discussions around pay structures for people, perhaps even permanent home workers or people who work abroad a lot of the time, which scales of pay, you know, regional pay, overseas pay, is it going to be linked to the UK? What if what if you've got another base of operations in the country where the employee is? You know, which do they get to choose which rate to pay? None of these are straightforward. I think the best solution, it's a bit it's a classic employment law solution, is have a policy, think it through, think about all the practical aspects of this, work out the information that you need. Again, I'm an employment lawyer, litigator, so let's let's just uh, talk briefly around disputes. We hope it doesn't happen in practice. But one of the things that, that 
you need to get your head around if you're going to allow this is which laws will apply if there's a dispute about termination, for example. And this is a really tricky area of law. There's lots of various complex and overlapping rules about the territorial scope of UK law. Does it apply to someone who doesn't normally work in the UK? And what about the law where the employee is working? I mean, the general rule is an employee is normally protected by the laws of the country in which they're working. But of course, that's pretty much premised on the idea that they will be working for an employee who's based in that in that country. What's not obvious yet is whether home working applies in the same way. If you work from home for a UK employer, but your home is in, I don't know, Mallorca, <laughs> does Spanish law apply? I think if you ask a Spanish lawyer, they, it wouldn't be obvious to them why it would. What's the link to Spain other than an internet connection? And this is the problem. It's tricky because there is frequently no link between the employer and the location where the employee is working. The employer may not even be based there and they may not even have assets there. So there's then, you know, you go through all these legal problems and then there's a real world issue about, well, where are you going to get sued if it goes wrong? Can you get sued in a place where you don't have a location and you don't have any assets? For what it's worth, my sense is that uh, we're going to see a, a trend of home workers working for UK employers under a, an arrangement where the employees allowed that to be uh, effectively um, protected by UK law because they will, it seems to me, almost inevitably have some kind of designated or assigned workplace that will be in the UK, some place where they're trained from or where they have to go for training. And so there will be a link to the UK that gets them home from a UK employment law perspective. Peter, we've Uh, I'm mindful that if you and I, we could talk a lot about all the problems and the risks to do with this, but there is an upside, isn't there? So taking your tax hat off and putting on your HRD hat, what are the opportunities we might see from this? I think the first and most practical one is the there's a much wider pool of talent to recruit from because you see certainly people don't always want to move for their job, particularly if their spouse has a job, which has been an increasing problem in the expatriate area for many years now. And so if you can take a job in another country without your spouse having to give up their job, then that will always be useful and helpful. Uh, it will be a solution also to the expense of relocations and the amount of time it takes to get people settled in a new country, kids settled in a new school. If you can work in London from Germany, then you don't have to move, then why wouldn't you? I think also countries with immigration concerns where it's difficult to get specific visas or work permits, then if you can't bring a person into that country, you can then move the job to the person. I think that's an area where immigration protectionism has potentially led to the opposite outcome of what was expected. If you don't want people to bring people in to do a job, the job moves to where the people are if you're not careful, which of course means their salary gets spent elsewhere. And I think you can enhance employee engagement without increasing the costs, because if you have uh, people don't have to commute and they, you know, we've seen a lot of the benefits of not having to go to an office every day, if you can then Combine that with being where you want to be. So at 6, 5.30, you finish work, and at 5.31, you're already somewhere that you really want to be rather than somewhere that you can afford to live to get into the city centre. I think that really helps. But I do think the downside is corporate culture does suffer if people are away from their offices. It's easier to take an existing team virtual than to build a new team uh, virtually. And so if you then do move to remote working, it is going to be more complex and particularly where some people are remote and some people aren't. So you're always going to have to balance those two. But I think on the whole, companies that use this widely are going to see benefits from it. And if they're proactive about managing the compliance and engagement risks, then I think they can uh, really get ahead of the game here. Thanks, Peter. Let's finish off by drawing together just in the last 30 seconds the the key points what is it that we should be doing now and what's coming down the tracks what you need to do now is very simple is work out who was somewhere where they may have a tax filing for 2020 and make sure you haven't missed the tax filing deadline yet or if you have get it uh, straightened out as soon as possible 
Likewise for 2021, if you're getting close to day 183, be clear whether you are prepared to support employees that are working remotely or whether you wish to tell them that they need to be back in the office by the end of June to avoid the company incurring excessive costs. After that, I think you need to look at you know, return to work policies and um, future remote work policies to understand what you're trying to achieve as a client, as a corporate, as a co- you know, employer. What do you actually want from your remote workers, both those in their home country and potentially those abroad? And how do you intend to organize that workforce in a new way? And after that, I think you can plan now what do you intend to do for the future in terms of your longer term staffing model? Are you going to look for skills in different places compared to where you have before? Are you going to take advantage of salary level arbitrage? You know, instead of paying a London waiting for people in London, are you going to pay a UK regional pay scale? But does that mean you're then going to end up paying more than you expect by paying their commuting costs when you want them in London? Or are you going to go further and pay a European pay scale and then have flight cost of bringing them over. I think that's a longer term discussion you should really be doing later. Manage the immediate concerns now and then have one eye on what your longer term opportunities are later. Peter, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. We hope you enjoyed listening. Tune in next time for the next episode of Disputes in Perspective. Disputes in Perspective is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ellie McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's litigation and dispute resolution practice, please email disputesandperspective at reedsmith.com. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, Stitcher, and reedsmith.com, and our social media accounts at Reed Smith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. All rights reserved.